Hello, everyone. Thanks very much, Sarah. And uh, it's great to be with you all this evening to tell you a bit about Sensine Health. So uh, a little bit about my background first. I've been a, a science entrepreneur for something like 30 years, apart from a period in public uh, service when I was a uh, defence minister and science minister in the previous Labour government. And after a PhD in robotics, my experience has primarily been in healthcare. Um, I founded and then built Powderjet Pharmaceuticals into a profitable FTSE 250 company over 10 years before selling it for approximately $900 million in 2003. So after my time in government, I founded Sensign to fulfill a specific need, really to realize the potential of the data that is held in the electronic health records of the NHS and to analyze that data, to use that data to unlock new insights that could improve patient care, but also accelerate the development of new medicines by the pharmaceutical industry, really to unlock the potential of what is in effect a sovereign asset of the United Kingdom and to overcome the barriers, technical, financial and political, that were preventing it being used in that way. Now, we're fortunate in the UK in having a single provider health service. Everyone rich or poor, young or old has an NHS number. And each of us therefore has a longitudinal health record that follows us through our lives, documenting our health and the care and the treatments that we've received from the NHS. This data reflected in these health record reflects the full diversity of our population and the complexity of modern medical science. And through recent developments in data science, particularly in artificial intelligence, it is now possible and in fact cost effective to analyze this data to make new discoveries, relevant both to improving the way care is delivered, but also to discovering new medicines and improving the design of clinical trials. However, this is deeply personal data. And although market research tells us that the public do want this data to be used, they're very concerned to ensure that it is used in the right way. Sensign was set up to do exactly that. Our mission is to create a partnership with the National Health Service, which is then embedded in a trusted data community, which links patients, clinicians, healthcare providers, and the life science companies to enable the application of clinical artificial intelligence to analyze that data. And to do so in a transparent, fair, and effective way through providing a financial return, which is shared back into the NHS. This unique business model, which we, we sometimes describe as having a double bottom line, aligns the business obje objectives of Sensine Health as a for-profit public company with the values of the NHS, the values of the clinicians that work within it, which really enables us to form one team, which is most effective in accelerating this research. So Sensine today, two years after our IPO, we're uh, a company that was originally uh, formed from a spin out from Oxford University, one of the leading universities in the world in, in, in this type of research. We're based in Oxford. We employ approximately 130 people. We're generating revenues, approximately uh, 2 million revenues in our last financial year. Operating within this, this uh, what is really described as the healthcare artificial intelligence market, a very fast growing market worth about $36 billion um, expected in, in 2025. And we've seen, despite being a young company, um, just two years following our IPO, we're already working with something like 40% of NHS trusts here in the United Kingdom and have now created a data set which represents over 5.6 million NHS patients. Our customers are some of the largest pharmaceutical companies in the world, like Bayer, Roche, and Bristol Myers Squibb. But the work is only possible because of this ecosystem of partnerships which we've created, 
most importantly with the NHS Trust. You see some of the logos of those trusts that I'm, I'm shown below, but also in working in partnership with Microsoft, who provides us with technology, which enables us to scale the work that we do and have the capacity to be able to handle the very large amounts of data involved in the research that we do. So when thinking about Sensign, really, firstly, the raw material that we work with is the anonymized data reflected in the electronic health records that are provided to us by the NHS through our research partnerships. We then use uh, data science, artificial intelligence techniques to analyze this data for two sectors within the healthcare market. Life sciences are the pharmaceutical and medical device industry, where primarily we're helping pharmaceutical companies discover new medicines through deriving insights from the real world data in the electronic health records, or to improve the design of clinical trials for their late stage development. In the healthcare system itself for the NHS, we're doing two things. Firstly, we're developing and providing software applications which enable patients to be looked after remotely and in doing so improve their care, create data assets which enable us to undertake research into the particular disease area, for example, diabetes in pregnancy, and developing tools which enable us to provide real time insights back to doctors as they're making decisions within the healthcare service. So our unique business model, and it is unique, is, is based upon this idea that through the creation of the trusted data community, we can align ourselves with the, the needs that are, exist in those two areas of life sciences and healthcare, and act as effectively as a docking station which provides the necessary separation and manages the, the potential conflicts of interest through the sharing of this data. So no data is shared by Sensign Health to any of our pharmaceutical clients. We undertake the research on their behalf under a very strict ethical and information governance control, which is managed by the NHS Trust with whom we work in partnership. We then share the financial return back into the NHS in three ways, the NHS being a shareholder in, in the company, receiving equity in consideration of the provision of the data, currently uh, accounting for approximately 12% of the shareholding in Sensine Health. Secondly, through investment in improving the IT infrastructure around the curation of data. And thirdly, through a royalty share based upon the revenues generated by the business. The market drivers really, which sort of underpin the, the growth that we're seeing within this whole area and within Sensign really are described in this slide in sort of four quadrants. There's the, the fundamental demographics of aging populations across, across the globe and increasing unaffordably, unaffordability of healthcare. There's the way in which the pharmaceutical industry itself is struggling to improve R&D productivity medicines are too expensive for many markets and we need to improve the productivity of the research and development process. We're also seeing a recognition that, that medicine needs to be more personalized. We really need to get to the bottom of how people differ and how their treatments can be more suited to the particular characteristics that they have. That requires massive problems within data science to be solved and the sort of tools that we can now bring to bear because this data now exists are really making that possible. The fourth thing I'd mention has been the way in which the COVID pandemic has massively accelerated the use of these sort of tools in response to the pressures, the crisis that we've seen over the last seven months. So we're seeing a real speeding up, things happening in a matter of weeks that would previously have taken years as people are trying to find solutions to some of the challenges that have arisen through pressures on the healthcare service because of COVID. This slide gives you a summary of the type of data that we're able to work with. And it reflects the full complexity, if you like, of modern medical practice, includes everything within electronic health records. So x-rays, scans, um, prescriptions, tests that are, that are undertaken across the full range of therapeutic areas, um, 
and age groups, the demographics that the NHS has to, to uh, look after. The real advantage that the UK has, and why I describe this as a sovereign asset, is because the NHS is a single provider. And therefore, the quality and depth of the data that is available to us in, in the NHS here in the UK significantly better than exists in other countries in the world. You'll see the, the database has been growing really quite rapidly as more NHS trusts come on board with us now, over 5.6 million patients, representing something like 29 million patient encounters as patients have multiple entries within the database. So what is it that we do with this data? Well, firstly, all of the data is anonymized before it gets to us. That's the responsibility of the NHS. And the NHS also gives permission for the research that we do. We only do medical research and we only do research which has gone through an ethical uh, committee approval process by the NHS. All of this done within a framework which provides us with the confidence that not only are we meeting all of the data protection legislation and principles under which this data must be used, but also that higher standard, if you like, of fundamental fairness of providing that return back into the system through the provision of this data. We focus on the later stages of clinical development. We're working on in most of our projects at the moment is in the later stage of clinical trials where you're testing whether a medicine is safe, the placebo to the treatment, but also using the real world data from the wider electronic records of the patients who've had similar conditions. And in doing so, being able to better inform the design of those clinical trials. And in some cases, even being able to replace the placebo arm of the clinical trial with the synthetic data arm based upon that real world data from the electronic health records. So we've been working with uh, a number of pharmaceutical companies in this area, like uh, Bayer, um, with whom we're working in cardiovascular disease, Roche, Alexion, and most recently Bristol Myers Squibb. Really this validating over the last two years, the value of this research for our pharmaceutical customers. But of course, Building this as a business requires us to scale and automate the process. And so we've also been investing in the development of what we call our Sense clinical algorithm engine, which provides the ability to develop algorithms to improve understanding through the analysis of this data as an automated process. So using the electronic health records as the core data source, then building a system which is able to answer in real time questions of that, of that data to be able to, as I say, automate that process. To give you one example of that, which has been really useful at this time of, of the COVID pandemic, which is to use the information on the patient records of patients being admitted to A&E with COVID infection in the context of the thousands and thousands of patient records of patients admitted into hospital to come up with a real-time prediction of the risk of each of those patients needing to be admitted to intensive care and therefore predicting the burden on the intensive care system, numbers of beds, and provide that as information in real time into the administrators of the hospital. This has been developed in collaboration with Chelsea and Westminster Hospital in London. And we're really proud of the way in which this was able to be developed very rapidly in response to the pandemic. The other thing which is important about what we do is complement the data which exists in the, in the electronic health records with specific data sets generated by software products which we have developed in collaboration with the NHS to address certain conditions. So, for example, in the case of diabetes in pregnancy, something like 16% of women develop diabetes during pregnancy. We developed a software application which enables them to be looked after remotely. That now has, has enabled over 13,000 babies to be safely born to diabetic mothers in the UK over the last two years using that software. And in doing so has created the world's best data set on diabetes in pregnancy, a fantastic tool for research into that area. So to sum up, Sensign is a unique business um, pursuing a unique model. 
we're seeing over the, the last six to nine months, very strong operational momentum in the business. We've achieved all of our targets, which we set at IPO, the most important being building the data set up to that critical mass of 5 million patients. We're seeing real momentum around the work that we're doing for our pharmaceutical clients. And we're proud of the response that we've able, been able to make in contributing to helping to solve some of the challenges that the COVID has thrown at us. So the business is on track operationally and financially. The milestones that investors can expect from us over the next six months to the end of our financial year next April, you can see that the uh, key next step for us is to launch our first product, our software product, GDM Health in the United States, submitting our algorithms for regulatory approval in, with FDA and MHRA here in, in the UK, and signing new pharmaceutical projects and new strategic research agreements with NHS trusts. The investment case really, I think, is summed up by the fact that we believe that we have a business model which enables us to compete with the largest technology companies in the world working in this space, the likes of Google and others, because of this unique model which we have, which gives us access to this unique data, applying world-class science to the analysis of that data, and then through our uni unique partnership model with the NHS, aligning what it is we do with the values of the National Health Service. Thank you very much for listening to me. Really happy to take any questions that you've now got. Thank you very much indeed. And I like the way that you describe the NHS data as a sovereign asset. It's a it's a it's a wonderful expression. And thank you very much for talking us through the data protection legislation, the murky waters that you have to navigate. So for me, slide nine was a very important slide indeed. But what is the process of acquiring a database in this super compliant world? Because you haven't got all the NHS trusts in your portfolio. So the the process starts with a conversation with a particular trust about the challenges that that trust is facing, the areas that they wish to improve care. And so some trusts have focused on different therapeutic areas. So it might be a trust that's focused particularly on cancer, for example, as a cancer center, and identifying the improvements that are needed to the, in, to the IT systems within that trust to be able to make the data available in a form, which means that it can be effectively analyzed using these machine learning and artificial intelligence techniques. That process, if you like, of discussing that can take months and then leads to an understanding of how the particular trust can become part of that community of other trusts to build that database and then understand how we can do projects together, which are either projects for pharmaceutical clients where they're looking, for example, to understand uh, which particular patients would respond best to a particular new treatment, for example, in, in, in stroke or a particular project. So, for example, the, the example I gave of Chelsea and Westminster looking to help them manage the very quickly rising number of COVID patients that they're having to deal with. So it's very much led by the clinical need within the trust an identification of where there's alignment between the, 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 the focus that that trust has and what it is that Sensine is doing in trying to solve some of these problems in, in medical research. You talk about pharmaceutical clients. So I'll, I'll take my, my first question from the floor. And Mike Farrell asks, why would pharma companies not just go to the NHS and pay them for this information, cutting you out as the middleman? The, the, the value that Sensine creates here is to be a docking station which provides uh, an ethical separation between the pharmaceutical company and the research that they want to do and the NHS, which is after all a provider of, of care. So what Sensine does is invest in the curation of the data set, the building of the tools to analyze that data set, to enable the pharmaceutical companies to ask questions that can be answered with that data set efficiently and at a speed that fits with the commercial requirements of pharmaceutical development. Now, the NHS is not set up to do that. And if a pharmaceutical company went directly to an NHS trust, they would then be operating within an environment which was not, if you like, set up 
to work closely in collaboration with the pharmaceutical development processes that they have within an industry. The other thing is that we provide the benefits of scale. So as we've created this community, we build a data set which is much more valuable through its size and the diversity with which it covers. So it, it, it ranges up into Scotland with, uh, with um, in Glasgow, Somerset in the West, London, the Midlands. This gives the pharmaceutical uh, companies confidence that the data set is representative of the wider population. So your presentation has concentrated on anonymized data, anonymity and ethical control. But Dr. Janet Massey asks, how many patients know that you are using their data? So all of the trusts with whom we partner have a process of informing patients within those trusts about the use of data and describing the types of use. And we know that the consenting process, either through the software applications or through the individual trust themselves, is based upon patients welcoming, generally, the use of medical data in this way for this purpose. Where a patient does not wish their, their data to be used in this way, they, way they can indicate so, so, and their data is therefore removed from the database. Now, it's interesting you talked about how COVID-19 has actually helped com your company and companies operating within the sector because it's actually done some marketing um, for you. And I'm just wondering, COVID-19, how much that has shaped and defined your business this year? Because uh, Mark Proudfoot has, has asked about the share price, you know, that um, it was steadily falling and, and now it's, it's changed direction. Is that because of the COVID-19 effect? I, I wouldn't uh, agree that it, the COVID-19 has had a marketing effect. I think what COVID-19 has done has created an immense pressure on the health service and healthcare systems around the world. And therefore, people have looked for solutions to those pressures. Now, one of those solutions is the use of sophisticated information technology systems like, like the sort that we, that we work with. And what that has meant has been that people have moved more quickly to make decisions to try these things. And then when they've seen that they're working to adopt them, I would say it's the pace of adoption, which is which is really, really sped up in terms of the um, the progress of the business. I think that. Common to a number of, of companies operating within healthcare, there's been a, a, a recognition over the last six months of the importance of life science research as a result of COVID. And I think there's been a general interest in the sector um, after um, a few years of that not being so, I mean, I've been working in life sciences for, for a number of years now, and it definitely has gone through waves. I think that what's happened because of, of COVID and the effect of the economy is that investors are looking at life science companies um, more closely they're understanding how they really are an important plank for recovery from the, the, the pandemic. But also, I think here in the UK, a recognition that the UK is a world leader in this space. That one, one of the reasons why SenseSign exists is, is, as I've said, because of the particular nature of the NHS data, because it's a single provider. But it's also because of the quality of the computer science. The UK is one of three countries in the world that have really world-class data, data science expertise. And it's that combination which I think has enabled uh, SenSign and companies like SenSign to, to grow here in the UK. That's been reflected in this, that recognition has been reflected in the share price, I think. Okay, you mentioned the UK there. We've had a couple of questions about North American expansion and we've also got an investigative uh, retail investor um, asking, given GDPR regulation, can we infer that your recent senior hire from Google Health infers a UK business has an edge over US tech firms trying to enter this space? Yes, I would agree with, with that analysis. I think that the, the SenseSign does have an edge. And what is that edge? Is it is to work in partnership with the NHS through this shared mechanism of collaboration 
and shared financial return. Now, it is not possible for a company like Google to do that. And I think that when people are thinking about how they want to see their data to be used, they want to see it used in a way which is, of course, uh, fully compliant with all uh, legal requirements, but also goes further, really, uh, sort of answers a fundamental question of fairness. And that fairness really being a reinvestment back into the system that we all rely upon to, to deliver healthcare. One thing that's been really interesting for me is that although we invented this model here in the UK, very much based upon um, this idea of partnership with the NHS, we're now seeing real interest outside of the UK because these concerns about the way in which personal data is used, they're not just limited to the UK. And we're seeing in the United States and in other countries in the world, people are looking for models whereby this work can be done to analyze data, to, to find these insights, which clearly are you know, to the benefit of society, but being done in a way which helps bind society together, which is seen as fair, and, and not one where it's really just to the benefit of a huge monopolistic business. Okay, so your business has been going for, for two years. A lot of investors are very keen to hear about the growth and expansion plans, and one of your slides has covered that. Um, a question from the floor. There has been a number of board changes since the IPO. Uh, can you reassure investors and potential investors that the problems which led to disruption of the past has now been resolved and it's unlikely to reoccur? Absolutely. I can absolutely confirm that. Very good. Right. Um, how quickly can you leverage the Microsoft relationship? Well, we're really uh, we're doing that right now. So Microsoft provides us with tools that enable us to scale the, the software applications and the, the artificial intelligence platform that we're building and enables it to be used internationally and provides us with early access to the new tools that Microsoft has in development based around, for example, its Azure Cloud Platform. This really gives us a competitive advantage and enables what is you know, still quite a, a, a small early stage company of about 130 people to access the tools which enable us to compete and scale uh, internationally. Um, Microsoft also helps us to sell uh, some of our products. So, for example, as a, on a co-sell uh, agreement, and we're really excited about the potential of being able to leverage those tools as we grow Sensign in the future, particularly as we come to launch our first product in the United States. Um, the partnership with Microsoft is uh, it's a really important plank upon which we're doing that. And do come back and talk to us when that launch in the States occurs. There's been many, many more questions. And what we'd like to do, um, Lord Drayson, if it's all right, is maybe have a follow up video with you and pose the questions that I haven't been able to to you later on. That would be great. Yes, very happy to do that. Great. Thank you very much. Really enjoyed your company. Thank you very Thank much. You. indeed.